Strike. Why, yes, there's all of that and more in Ponsicle 2 Access Operations 1946 DLC, which finally breaks out of the usual confines of World War II and concludes the alternative history saga of Access Operations. With an absolutely mad and cannon breaking invasion of America through its Pacific coast, with massive naval engagements landing in Alaska and California, hard treks and wild rides across deserts and rocky mountains, dramatic setbacks in the Great Plains, and a final battle in the streets of Washington in June 1947. The usual American landmarks abound, and the thumbnail indeed doesn't lie. Mount Rushmore, you say? More like Mount Crushmore, my rice. 1946 is a grand experience of 30-plus missions that even rivals the base campaign of the game in a number of ways. So let's look at a few highlights. The expansion notably standardizes the objectives in its missions. We've had bonus and elite objectives before, of course, but now each has its own purpose. Taking a bonus objective hex brings you thousands of prestige now, something very nice in a campaign that makes you bleed prestige at every corner as if it's a vampire party. But it's always prestige and nothing but prestige. Elite objectives, on the other hand, demand more effort and indeed offer funny exclusive equipment and heroes. This more transparent tiering of objectives enables you to make rewarding strategic decisions as you plan the battle. With the thinking in the vein of, oh, they beat me hard last time and I'm low on prestige, so let me just take the easier four out of six bonus objectives for that and then rush the primaries. On the flip side, I felt the developers applied the system a bit too zealously as they included it in almost every mission of the campaign, somewhat dampening the enjoyment you can derive from exploring their objectives. The few battles that break this pattern really stand out though, such as that gorgeous autumn day when you nuke General Patton. And we cannot just overlook the headliner of the entire event, the Atom Bomb! You get to taste the gamma rays in the very first mission, and as the elite objectives generally supply you with V2 atomic missiles and colossal nuclear-equipped bombers, the temptation to turn the American continent into a mushroom plantation only grows. I must admit, I was reluctant to use the nuke at first, largely because of good old veteran gamer hubris. A weapon as powerful as this? Oh, it must be some sort of a balancing catch-up mechanism for the noobs, obviously, come on! Plus, you cannot but feel that as soon as you press that big red button, it's gonna War. War never changes. But as you delve deeper into the campaign, you just crush your doubts, you put on lead underwear, and you learn to love the bomb with all your heart. Sure, you can employ the usual tactical toolkit against the hooting and honking American hordes, cleverly arranging all your five-star camouflaged ultra-killer tank destroyers and flax against the tidal waves of enemy armor, but there's simply nothing that can turn a battle around as an unexpected seven-hex gap in the enemy line. What helps here is that in 1946, nukes offer a convincing show from a game mechanics perspective as well. The way the atomic explosion works here typically reduces the targeted unit to a strength of one, while the units around it lose about half their strength. I'm sure there's more nuance to this, but you can reasonably expect this sort of result when deciding whether to nuke or not to nuke. Atomic weapons dealing immense damage but ultimately not clearing the targets out entirely makes them such a fun tool in the battle. If you are the one using them, you still need to prepare to have your ground forces ready to immediately follow up and exploit the breach in the enemy line, they'll just reinforce on their turn. If you're on the receiving end of it, you can still retreat and replace without losing your precious core units, or let's be real, loading a save from a turn or two ago. This approach curbs the potential frustration frustration and gives meaning to the pretty fireworks you see. And speaking of fireworks, 1946 comes with a whole slew of new gear, with two items standing out in particular. One being the colossal million billion ton Landkreuzer tank, with a main caliber battleship turret for a, uh, uh, turret. It is effectively the calling card of the entire DLC, and I love these behemoths for how they stand for Panzer Corps II going full mask off on the ridiculous insanity of the entire old history affair, which goes hand in hand with the idea of conquering America through the Pacific. Landkreuzer is as if 
Wolfenstein and Supreme Commander had a baby, and it's majestic. Although it did not excite me too much mechanically, essentially being a very heavily armored piece of artillery, a battleship with tracks attached. It is a big boom, but it's not a boom you can't get with a couple of Grill 17s. What did excite me though were the Fugaku heavy bombers armed with long range air to surface missiles. With Fugakus in your force, you wipe out the mighty Pacific fleet with impunity, and while these planes don't hit land based targets too hard, their ability to launch missiles beyond the range of enemy anti air defenses gives you a glimpse of how close 1946 comes to a revolution. Radar controlled missiles, air to air and surface to air missiles, electronic countermeasures, dedicated at ATGM infantry, conventional ballistic missiles, all that is just around the corner, promising a wealth of potential new mechanics. But a lot of the new stuff that comes with 1946 is same good old punters and fighters and tank destroyers, with a little twist in the game's economy. You do get E-50s and E-75s to replace last year's Panther II and King Tiger for example, and surprisingly they don't bring better stats. In places the stats are actually worse. The trick is that the new stuff occupies fewer core slots, but costs a hell of a lot more and prestige. You can cram two E-50s in the space of one Panther II and pay six times more in prestige. This introduces an interesting trade-off for you to consider. Does it look like you need all that added firepower and you can afford to pay out the nose for it? Or can you skimp a little and make do with fewer older units? This doesn't work everywhere in practice, but I absolutely kept rearranging my fighter force with these thoughts in mind, for a solid jolt of energy reanimating the army and unit management game in Panzer Corps. And so, new weaponry or not, the war is over, and we finally have an America-shaped irradiated wasteland in our possession, marking a shining end to the Axis Operation Saga. With things getting a little stale around 1942, and 43, the series reinvented itself with a fresh alternative history branch, demonstrating that you don't need to stick to history for great World War II themed entertainment. And given that neither Panzer Corps nor especially Panzer General, whose heritage and system it builds on, have ever been too strong on historical battle simulation, one can comfortably say that 1946 is the highest point in that entire 30 year long history. It's 40 to 60 hours of stupid good fun that doesn't sell out on the theme, it's got all the mechanical innovations of Panzer Corps 2, and it offers every bit of scenario design trickery we've seen in Axis operations so far, and more. And finally, let me just go out on a limb and say that, if you have only played the base campaign of Panzer Corps 2, and aren't too keen to commit to the entire DLC saga, give 1946 a look. The story might seem a little bizarre, but this is Panzer Corps at its literal finest.